When I was a little boy, my mother made me sing in the children's choir in the church. And how they would laugh and fuss when on Sunday mornings I had to dress up for the occasion with the black cassock and the white surplus and this big black satin bow tie, this huge big tie and the starch collar. And my uncle would look at me and say, oh, there's little Lord Fauntleroy. And I was so embarrassed to have to go outside wearing this outfit. And we sang in the children's choir. And once a year, we would sing the same anthem called, Seek Ye the Lord While He May Be Found. And the highlight of our experience as choir boys was the singing of that anthem because the solo was sung by the lead soloist of the adult choir, who had a magnificent tenor voice. And he would sing the lead in, Seek ye the Lord while he may be found, and we would sing the background to it. And, and even though I was not a believer, and this was just a rote exercise that I engaged in because my parents forced me, there was something about that song that captured me. Seek ye the Lord while he may be found. Call ye upon him while he is near. Let the wicked forsake his way and the unrighteous man his thoughts, for he will have mercy and abundantly pardon. I never tried to memorize the words to that anthem, which are taken directly from the scriptures, as you well know. And yet I can't tell you how many times in my life the words of that anthem have come back into my consciousness. Seek ye the Lord while he may be found. And when I think of that verse, I don't hear the words in my mind as if someone were reading them from the written page. I hear the voice of Dick Dodds, the tenor from our adult choir, singing those words. Seek ye the Lord while he may be found. And I think how often the scripture calls upon us to come near to the living God, to seek his face, to search out his presence. And yet I realize now that the Bible says that by nature no one seeks after God, that the seeking after God, as Jonathan Edwards taught, is the business of the Christian. We don't begin to seek God until God has first converted our hearts. The seeking of God is the lifelong pursuit of the believer. Because by nature, we are not seekers of God, but we are fugitives from God. Ever since Adam and Eve fled from the presence of God, you recall that in paradise, that when God would walk in the cool of the garden, his creatures would be filled with delight and a joyous sense of anticipation to have fellowship with their maker until they sinned. And the first reaction to their sin was a reaction of flight. They fled from the presence of God. They fled from the open spaces of Eden and sought refuge in the trees. They became denizens of the forest. They became people in hiding, fugitives from the face of God. That's our nature, to flee from his presence. And yet the psalmist declares, where can we flee from his presence? If we ascend into heaven, he is there. If we make our bed in Sheol, behold, he is there. And I say this for this reason. We're about to take a brief look at one of the smallest prophetic books in the Old Testament, which gives us the story of the ultimate fugitive. A man who fled from the presence of God, not because he was a pagan, but rather he was a believer who was fleeing from the presence of God. And so our message today is not directed to the unbeliever who is a fugitive and is involved in a relentless attempt at escape from God. I'm talking to the Christian who must understand that that propensity to flee from God does not end at our conversion. How many times in your life have you had a sense of vocation, a sense of God's calling you to do something, and you ignored it? 
or you neglected it, or you denied it, or you put it off, or in some way or another you sought to find a way to avoid your vocation. To flee from doing that which God called you to do. Isn't that common to us? Don't we all struggle with that problem? That's why it is of great importance and benefit to us from time to time to come back and read the little book that is called the book of Jonah. Because Jonah is the story not of a man who diligently pursued the presence of God, but the story of a man who took flight from his duty, from his calling, from his responsibility, and even thought to escape from the very presence of God. Let's look now at the beginning of this little book of Jonah. We read in the first chapter of the book of Jonah these words. Now the word of the Lord came to Jonah, the son of Amittai, saying, Arise, Go to Nineveh, that great city, and cry out against it, for their wickedness has come up before me. How many times have you wished that you could hear the audible voice of God? How many times have you said, my faith would be enormous if God would somehow communicate with me directly? Would it? Perhaps it might depend on what he said when he spoke to you. Because here we have an occasion where the word of the Lord came to a man. And the word of the Lord that came to this man was a word of commandment by which God gave a mission to Jonah. Jonah, arise and go to Bermuda and be a missionary. No. <laughs> he didn't call him to go to Bermuda. He said, arise and go to Nineveh, that great city. Where was Nineveh? Nineveh was the last capital city of the Assyrian Empire, located in that part of the world which today is the nation of Iraq. Not the most popular tourist destination of modern Americans to go to Iraq. Well, it wasn't all that popular of a destination. It wasn't a resort city in the sight of Jonah either. God said, Arise, go to Nineveh, that great city, and cry out against it. Do you hear what God is calling Jonah to do? Jonah, I've called you to preach my word, not to Israel but to one of the most pagan people on the face of the globe, to a nation that is mighty, to a nation that is the historic enemy of the Jewish people here in the 8th century B.C., I want you to go to the very heart of the Assyrian Empire, and I want you to preach my word to that city and call that city to repentance. Hardly an enviable task that God has given to Jonah. Well, Jonah obeyed the first part of the call. The first part of the command that God had given him was to arise. And so Jonah arose, we read in verse 3. But he did not arise to go to Nineveh. But rather, he rose up to run away from his duty. The Bible says this in verse 3. But Jonah arose to flee to Tarshish from the presence of the Lord. And so he went down to Joppa and found a ship going to Tarshish. So he paid the fare and went down into it to go with them to Tarshish from the presence of the Lord. This is a willful, premeditated act of disobedience. God said, Jonah, arise, go to Nineveh. Jonah says, I will rise, and I will flee from the presence of God, and I will go to Tarshish. Now, we don't know for sure where ancient Tarshish was, but the best guesstimate of the scholars is that Tarshish was in what now would be called 
Spain, which in terms of the known world at that time and one's ability to travel by ship was virtually the furthest port to which Jonah could sail away from Nineveh. He made an effort to get as far away from his destiny as he possibly could. Like the prodigal son of whom Jesus spoke, he went to a far country, thinking that there he could escape the presence of God. How like Jonah we are, thinking that we can find some remote place in this world where God's presence is not there. How foolish was Jonah to think for a second that there was any corner of this globe where God's presence did not extend, to think that he could escape the all-present, all-seeing eye of the God who had commanded him to do something. But all Jonah wanted to do was to get as far away from his mission as he possibly could. And so he paid the fare and went down into the ship to go with them to Tarshish from the presence of the Lord. And then in verse 4 of chapter 1 of the book of Jonah, we read this. But the Lord sent out a great wind on the sea, and there was a mighty tempest on the sea, so that the ship was about to be broken up. Now listen to this. There's something that I find fascinating in this little narrative. So often the people of Israel are compared, or I should say contrasted, to the animal kingdom or the kingdom of flowers or nature, where the stars obey the course in which they were sent by God, and the eagle flies in the direction that God sends the eagle, and the plants go through their seasons and their cycles as they have been ordained by their Creator. And so often, God says to the people, to consider the rest of my creation. Everything else in creation obeys my voice. But you, O oh man, and you alone, are in rebellion and in defiance to my commands. Now notice this. In the very first few verses of the first chapter of Jonah, God sends two things. First, he sends a man. Does the man go? No. The man does not go where God sends him. But then in verse 4, we read, And the Lord sent out a great wind of the sea. The man doesn't go where God tells him to go, but the wind does go where God tells the wind to go. And the wind does exactly what God commands the wind to do. And the wind is chasing after Jonah. And so the wind goes out to sea, and there was a mighty tempest on the sea, so that the ship was about to be broken up. And the mariners were afraid, says the Scriptures, and every man cried out to his God. You have not foxhole theists here, but pagans who are crying out to their pagan deities because they're about to perish in the sea. And they threw the cargo that was in the ship into the sea to lighten the load. But Jonah had gone down into the lowest parts of the ship, had lain down, and was fast asleep. Just as Nero fiddled while Rome was burning, so Jonah slept while his shipmates were about to perish. Deep in the bowels of the ship, he was impervious to the storm that was brewing and the threat that had arisen. How often, like Jonah, when the judgment of God comes, it finds us asleep, completely unconscious to what's going on. And so the captain came to him and said to him, What do you mean, sleeper? Arise, call on your God. Perhaps your God will consider us so that we may not perish. And so they said to one another, Come on, let's cast lots that we may know for whose cause this trouble has come upon us. So they cast lots. And the lot fell upon Jonah. And they said to him, Please tell us, for whose cause is this trouble upon us? What is your occupation? Where do you come from? What's your country? Of what people are you? 
You see what's going on here? These pagans, they all believe that the world is somehow controlled by the gods. And when adversity comes and tragedy comes, they have a strong view of providence, even if it's a misguided, poor theological understanding. At least they have some understanding of providence. And they realize that these kinds of events do not happen by chance. So they cast lots to find out whose sin has provoked the wrath of the gods. And the lot falls upon Jonah. And so they say to him, who are you? And so he said to them, I am a Hebrew, and I fear the Lord, the God of heaven, who made the sea and the dry land. Wow. Whoever these mariners were, from whatever country they sailed, everybody in the ancient world had heard the stories and the tales of the dreadful power and omnipotence of Yahweh, the Lord God of Israel. And now when Jonah reveals his identity, saying, I am a Hebrew, do you see what this does to the rest of the sailors? Well, if we don't appease this God who's brought this storm, we're going to die. But if we harm this man who's a child of Yahweh, that may make him even more angry. And so they're between a rock and a hard place. But they make up their mind, and they make up their mind pretty quickly. They're going to risk Jonah <laughs> rather than the storm. And they said, then the men were exceedingly afraid, and they said to him, why have you done this? For the men knew that he fled from the presence of God because he told them. And so they asked him, what shall we do that the sea may be calm for us? For the sea was growing more and more tempestuous. And he said to them, pick me up and throw me into the sea. And the sea will become calm for you. For I know that this great tempest is because of me. We have the expression ever since that episode, when things go bad, perhaps there's a Jonah in our midst. Perhaps there is one among us who has so provoked the anger of God that all of us are being exposed to danger and to his fury. It is to Jonah's credit that he acknowledges his guilt before these pagan people. And he says to them, I am the man. This, I believe, is the first instance that we read in Scripture of God's calming an angry sea. In the New Testament, it's accomplished by the command of Christ, peace be still on the Sea of Galilee. But here, the Mediterranean is a cauldron it can only be calmed by a human sacrifice. And Jonah says, throw me into the sea. Nevertheless, the men rowed hard to return to land, but they could not. They didn't want to sacrifice one of them. They were sailors. They didn't throw people overboard. But they couldn't, for the sea continued to grow more tempestuous against them. Therefore, they cried out to the Lord, and they said, Please, O Lord, do not let us perish for this man's life, and do not charge us with innocent blood. For you, O Lord, have done as it pleased you. And so they picked up Jonah and threw him into the sea. And the sea ceased from its raging. And the men feared the Lord exceedingly and offered a sacrifice to the Lord and took vows. They offered two sacrifices. One was Jonah, and then their own sacrifices. And they took vows to be obedient to this God who can bring the sea into such trouble. But that's not the end of the story. That's the end of our time. And so like the old perils of Pauline and the serial stories of the movies and the television, we have to ask to wait for you to tune into the next time to see what happens. Now at least the immediate danger is past. The sea is calm. We see the rescue of the sailors. But what of Jonah, who has been hurled into the sea? We'll look at that in our next session. I asked today how many of us have had the occasion in our lives of fleeing from the call of God. It's not all that uncommon. And there's a reason why we receive the story of Jonah 
from the mouth of God. It is a sober warning to every believer to be diligent in one's openness and obedience to the call of God upon our lives. God does not always call us to glory, and He does not always call us to comfort. He calls us at times to go to uncomfortable places at inconvenient times at great worldly cost. And yet there is no higher privilege than to be called of God, to be a minister in His name, to be an agent of reconciliation to a dying world. And to fulfill that destiny may be extremely painful at times. But yet when God places His hand upon us and His call upon our lives, beloved, we really don't have a choice. <laughs> I mean, we have the choice in the sense that we can kick against it and we can stumble and we can flee. But we can't escape our vocation. And so when God calls you and puts a task upon you, consider His servant Jonah and be wise. Don't wait until He throws you in to the midst of the sea before you awaken to your responsibilities. I think the greatest sermon ever preached on the book of Jonah was perhaps never really preached. The only time I heard it, I heard it in the movies, and the preacher was Charles Lawton. He was in this movie delivering a sermon that was composed for a novel, not for a Sunday morning service. It's my favorite novel, of course, Moby Dick. In the opening chapters of that great work, we find Ishmael on the Sabbath day before he sets sail and joins Ahab for his pursuit of the great white whale. We find Ishmael roaming through the streets of New Bedford in search of the whaler's chapel. And he enters into the chapel that Sabbath morning, and the minister, Father Mapple, rises to the pulpit and delivers a sermon on the book of Jonah. Now, I'm going to do something I almost never do, and that is, rather than give my own exposition of Jonah or any other text that we might be working on, I'm going to ask your indulgence as I read for you today portions of that magnificent exposition that Melville gives us through the lips of his character, Father Mapple, of the Whaler's Chapel in New Bedford. We read in Melville's Moby Dick these words, where after Father Mapple has risen to the pulpit, he says, Shipmates, this book, referring to the book of Jonah, containing only four chapters, four yarns, is one of the smallest strands in the mighty cable of the Scriptures. Yet what depths of the soul Jonah's deep sea lines sound. What a pregnant lesson to us is this prophet. What a noble thing is that canticle in the fish's belly. How billow-like and boisterously grand. We feel the flood surging over us. We sound with him to the kelpy bottom of the waters. Seaweed and all the slime of the sea is about us. But what is the lesson? that the book of Jonah teaches. Shipmates, it's a two-stranded lesson, a lesson to us all as sinful men, and a lesson to me as a pilot of the living God. As sinful men, it is a lesson because it is a story of the sin, hard-heartedness, suddenly awakened fears, the swift punishment, repentance prayers, and finally the deliverance and joy of Jonah. And then he goes on and tells of how Jonah encounters his difficulty because he has disobeyed God. And Father Mapple says, with this sin of disobedience in him, Jonah still further flouts at God by seeking to flee from him. 
He thinks that a ship made by men will carry him into countries where God does not reign, but only the captains of this earth. He skulks about the wharves of Joppa and seeks a ship that is bound for Tarshish. There lurks perhaps a hitherto unheeded meaning here. By all accounts, Tarshish could have been no other city than the modern Cadiz. That's the opinion of learned men. And where is Cadiz, shipmates? Cadiz is in Spain. So far by water from Joppa as Jonah could possibly have sailed in those ancient days when the Atlantic was an almost unknown sea. See not then, shipmates, that Jonah sought to flee worldwide from God. Miserable man. Oh, most contemptible and worthy of all scorn. With slouched hat and guilty eye skulking from his God. Prowling among the shipping like a vile burglar hastening to cross the seas. So disordered, self-condemning in his look. That had there been a policeman in those days, Jonah on the mere suspicion of something wrong, would have been arrested before he touched a deck. How plainly he's a fugitive. No baggage, not a hat box, valise, or carpet bag, no friends accompanying him to the wharf with their audio. And at last, after much dodging search, he finds the Tarshish ship receiving the last items of her cargo. And as he steps on board to see its captain in the cabin, all the sailors for the moment desist from hoisting in the goods to mark the stranger's evil eye. Jonah sees this, but in vain he tries to look all ease and confidence. In vain essays his wretched smile. Strong intuitions of the man assure the mariners he can be no innocent. In their gamesome but still serious way, one whispers to the other, Jack. He's robbed a widow. Or Joe, do you mark him? He's a bigamist. Or Harry, lad, I guess he's the adulterer that broke jail in old Gomorrah. Or belike one of the missing murderers from Sodom. Another runs to read the bill that's stuck against the spile upon the wharf to which the ship is moored, offering 500 gold coins for the apprehension of a parasite and containing a description of the person. He reads, then looks from Jonah to the bill, while all his sympathetic shipmates now crowd round about Jonah, prepare to lay their hands upon him. Frightened Jonah trembles, summoning all his boldness to his face, only looks so much more the coward. He will not confess himself suspected, but that itself is strong suspicion, so he makes the best of it, and when the sailors find him not to be the man that is advertised, they let him pass. And he descends into the cabin. Who's there? cries the captain at his busy desk, hurriedly making out his papers for the customs. Who's there? Oh, how that harmless question mangles Jonah. For the instant, he almost turns to flee again. But he rallies. I seek a passage in this ship to Tarshish. How soon sail ye, sir? Thus far, the busy captain had not looked up to Jonah, though the man now stands before him, but no sooner does he hear that hollow voice than he darts a scrutinizing glance. We sail with the next coming tide. No sooner, sir? Soon enough for any honest man that goes a passenger. Ha! Jonah, that's another stab. But he swiftly calls away the captain from that scent. I'll sail with ye, he says, the passage money. How much is it? I'll pay now. For it is particularly written, shipmates, as if it were a thing not to be overlooked in this history, that he paid the fare thereof before the craft did sail. And taken with the context, this is full of meaning. Now Jonah's captain, shipmates, was one whose discernment detects crime in any, but whose cupidity exposes it only in the penniless. In this world, shipmates, sin that pays its way can travel freely and without a passport. Whereas virtue, if a pauper, is stopped at all frontiers. So Jonah's captain prepares to test the length of Jonah's purse ere he judge him openly. He charges him thrice the usual sum, and it's assented to. Then the captain knows that Jonah's a fugitive, but at the same time resolves to help a flight that paves its rear with gold.
Yet when Jonah fairly takes out his purse, prudent suspicions still molest the captain. He rings every coin to find a counterfeit. Not a forger anyway, he mutters. And Jonah is put down for his passage. Point out my stateroom, sir, says Jonah now. I'm travel weary and I need sleep. Thou lookest like it, says the captain. There's thy room. Jonah enters and would lock the door, but the lock contains no key. Hearing him foolishly fumbling there, the captain laughs lowly to himself and mothers something about the door of convex cells being never allowed to be locked from within. All dressed and dusty as he is, Jonah throws himself into his berth and finds the little stateroom ceiling almost resting on his forehead. The air is close, and Jonah gasps. Then in that contracted hole, sunk to beneath the ship's waterline, Jonah feels the heralding presentiment of that stifling hour when the whale shall hold him in the smallest of his bowels wards. Screwed at its axis against the side, a swinging lamp slightly oscillates in Jonah's room, and the ship, heeling over towards the wharf with the weight of its last bales received, the lamp, flame and all, though in slight motion, still maintains a permanent obliquity with reference to the room. Though in truth infallibly straight itself, it has made obvious the false lying levels among which it hung. The lamp alarms and frightens Jonah as lying in his berth, his tormented eyes roll round the place, then the thus far successful fugitive finds no refuge for his restless glance. But that contradiction in the lamp more and more appalls him. The floor, the ceiling, the side, they're all awry. Oh, so my conscience hangs in me, he groans. Straight upward, so it burns. But the chambers of my soul are all in crookedness. Now, like one who, after a night of drunken revelry, hies to his bed, still reeling, but with conscience yet pricking him as the plungings of the Roman racehorse, but so much the more strike his steel tags into him, as one who is in that miserable plight still turns and turns in giddy anguish, praying God for annihilation until the fit be passed. And at last, amid the whirl of woe, he feels a deep stupor steals over him, as over the man who bleeds to death. For conscience is the wound, and there's nothing to staunch it. And so, after sore wrestling in his birth, Jonah's prodigy of ponderous misery drags him drowning down to sleep. And now the time of tide has come. The ship casts off her cables, and from the deserted wharf, the uncheered ship for Tarshish, all careening, glides out to sea. That ship, my friends, was the first of recorded smugglers. The contraband was Jonah. But the sea rebels. He will not bear the wicked burden. A dreadful storm comes on. The ship is like to break. But now when the boatswain calls all hands to lighten her, when boxes, bales, and jars are clattering overboard, when the wind is shrieking and the men are yelling, and every plank thunders with trampling feet right over Jonah's head, in all this raging tumult, Jonah sleeps his hideous sleep. He sees no black sky and raging sea, feels not the reeling timbers, and little hears he or heeds he the far rush of the mighty whale, which even now with open mouth is cleaving the seas after him. Aye, shipmates, Jonah was gone down to the sides of the ship, a berth in the cabin as I have taken it, and was fast asleep. But the frightened master comes to him and shrieks in his dead ear, What meanest thou, O sleeper, arise? And startled from his lethargy by that direful cry, Jonah staggers to his feet, and stumbling to the deck grasps a shroud to look upon the sea. <laughs> 
But at that moment, he is sprung upon by a panther billow leaping over the bulwarks. And wave after wave leaps into the ship and find no speed event roars flooring aft until the mariners come nigh to drowning while still afloat. And ever as the white moon shows her affrighted face from the steep gullies in the blackness overhead, aghast Jonah sees the rearing bowsprit pointing high upward, but soon beat downward against toward the tormented deep. Terrors upon terrors run shouting through his soul. And in all his cringing attitudes, the god fugitive is now too plainly known. The sailors mark him. More and more certain grow their suspicions of him. And at last, fully to test the truth by referring the whole matter to high heaven, they fall to casting lots to see for whose cause this great tempest was upon them. The lot is Jonah's. That discovered, and then how furiously they mob him with their questions. What is thine occupation? Whence comest thou, thy country? What people? But mark now, my shipmates, the behavior of poor Jonah. The eager mariners but ask him who he is and where he's from. Whereas they not only receive an answer to these questions, but likewise another answer to a question not put by them. But the unsolicited answer is forced from Jonah by the hard hand of God that is upon him. I am a Hebrew, he cries. And then, I fear the Lord, the God of heaven, who hath made the sea and the dry land. Fear him, O Jonah. Aye. Well, mightest thou fear the Lord God then. Straightway, he now goes on to make a full confession. Whereupon the mariners became more and more appalled, but still are pitiful. For when Jonah, not yet supplicating God for mercy, since he but too well knew the darkness of his deserts, when wretched Jonah cries out to them to take him and cast him forth into the sea, for he knew that for his sake this great tempest was upon him, they mercifully turn from him and seek by other means to save the ship. But all in vain. The indignant gale howls louder, and then with one hand raised invokingly to God, with the other they not unreluctantly lay hold of Jonah. And now behold Jonah, taken up as an anchor, and dropped into the sea, when instantly an oily calmness floats from the east, and the sea is still. As Jonah carries down the gale with him, leaving smooth water behind, he goes down in the whirling heart of such a masterless commotion that he scarce heeds the moment when he drops seething into the yawning jaws awaiting him. And the whale shoots to all his ivory teeth like so many white bolts upon his prison. And then Jonah prayed. But observe his prayer. And learn a weighty lesson. For sinful as he is, Jonah does not weep and wail for direct deliverance. He feels that his dreadful punishment is just. He leaves all his deliverance to God, contenting himself with this, that in spite of all his pains and pangs, he will still look toward his holy temple. And here, shipmates, is true and faithful repentance, not clamorous for pardon, but grateful for punishment. And how pleasing to God was this conduct in Jonah is shown in the eventual deliverance of him from the sea and the whale. Shipmates, I do not place Jonah before you to be copied for his sin. But I do place him before you as a model of repentance. Sin not, but if you do, take heed to repent of it like Jonah. Now that's not the end of the sermon that was preached by Father Mapple in New Bedford.
he goes on with some concluding remarks that I won't take the time to illustrate. But what I like about this rendition of Jonah from the pen of Herman Melville is that Melville takes an existential look at the story. He gets into the very skin of Jonah. He makes the text come alive. Oh, that's a bad thing to say because the text already is alive. I should say that the text makes Melville come alive. But Melville, who had such a love affair with the sea and all things associated with sailing, identified with this human being who was a fugitive from God. Perhaps he was the model for Melville's own Redburn, who sought refuge in a far land. But it's obvious that he understood the heartbeat of Jonah and of those who would seek to flee from the presence of God. I commend to you the reading of the full text of this sermon from Herman Melville as it is uttered through the lips of Father Mapple. And if you have the opportunity ever to see the film version of Moby Dick, you will take note of the portion of the sermon that is given on the screen by Charles Lawton. But more importantly, we should heed the advice of Father Mapple himself that we emulate Jonah not in his sin, but in his spirit of penitence, which is marked foremost by his acknowledgement that his punishment is just. How like David is Jonah at that moment, where in David's magnificent psalm of repentance, Psalm 51, in his spirit of contrition, in his broken and contrite heart, he asked God to treat him according to his mercy and not according to his justice, and yet at the same time acknowledges that God would be perfectly right, perfectly just, and perfectly clear to bring the full judgment of his wrath upon David's own head. That's the posture of Jonah. That's the posture of all who come to repentance. In our time today, I didn't have the opportunity to complete Melville's rendition of Father Mapple's sermon on the book of Jonah. But I would like to read now its conclusion as Father Mapple addresses his words not so much to the lay person as he does to the clergy. And so if there are any clergy who are listening to this, take heed. Father Mapple concludes his sermon with these words, Finally Jonah did the Almighty's bidding. And what was that, shipmates? It was to preach the truth to the face of falsehood. That was it. This, shipmates, is that other lesson, and woe to that pilot of the living God who slights it. Woe to him whom this world charms from gospel duty. Woe to him who seeks to pour oil upon the waters when God has brewed them into a gale. Woe to him who seeks to please rather than to appall. Woe to him whose good name is more to him than goodness. Woe to him who in this world courts not dishonor. Woe to him who would not be true, even though to be false were salvation. Yea, woe to him who, as the great pilot Paul has it, while preaching to others, is himself a castaway. I remember an experience I had when I was a seminary student that shocked me. And perhaps I'm still not over it, and that's why I remember it. But when I was a senior in seminary, I was required to write a term paper for a Hebrew exegesis class I was taking. And so I did my paper on the literary genre of the book of Jonah. And I made the argument that the book of Jonah was basically written in the literary form of historical narrative with the exception, of course, of chapter 2, which is the record of Jonah's famous prayer 
which is written in a poetic meter. But the rest of the book is written in a normal historical narrative style. And I took that position in light of the debate historically over how the book of Jonah is to be interpreted. Some scholars have seen Jonah simply as a myth or a legend or a parable or an extended poem. And I was taking the position that it was substantively historical narrative. And my professor called me in to see him after he had read my term paper, and he was all excited. And he wanted me to submit my term paper for publication in some scholarly journal that specialized in this kind of research. And I was flattered, but I was also amazed because the reason the professor was so excited about my paper was that the thesis of it was so radically novel. He thought that this was such a startling position and that he had never considered the possibility that there could be any historical narrative element to the book of Jonah. And I said to him, sir, I said, if I publish this article, I'd be sued for plagiarism, not because I copied it verbatim from some other source, but don't you realize that the position that I'm taking here is the classic Christian position on this book? And he had never heard of it. This was an exceedingly liberal seminary, and my professor was about ready to retire. He was in his mid-60s. He had gone to a liberal college, a liberal seminary, a liberal graduate school, and in his whole life, he had never exposed himself to any conservative scholarship. And it stunned me because at that time, it was the pastime of liberal scholars to make fun of conservative scholars and call them obscurantists, that is, people who refuse to look at various ideas other than their own. And I said at the time, it was impossible for a conservative to get a Ph.D., in theology in those days without being widely exposed to higher critical theories because they were so dominant in the academic world. Yet it was possible for a person to go all the way through his education and teach for 30 years in a liberal environment and never expose themselves to anything of a conservative nature. And that's why it shocked me to such a degree and stuck out in my mind. But it is an important question for us because the book of Jonah tells the story of a historical event that borders, at least, on the miraculous. And it captures the attention of people when they say, oh, you don't believe these fairy tales of a man being swallowed by a whale like Monstro in Pinocchio. And... <laughs> <laughs> and actually surviving for three days and then being vomited up safely on the dry land, as we read in the book of Jonah. And I remember my professor, even in that day, showing us articles that were ridiculing the book of Jonah because of investigations that had been done on the largest kinds of whales existing in the world today, and arguing that if a man were inside the belly of that whale for three days, that the juices that are secreted in the stomach cavity of that fish would kill the person. And all those kinds of debates were being carried out, although it was interesting in the 60s, there was a news report out of Japan of a person who was swallowed by a whale. And we don't know how long he was inside the whale, but he actually survived the experience. But then I also remember our professor saying that the book cannot be taken as historic information seriously because of some of the details that are found in Jonah's description of his adventure, particularly in chapter 2. If we look at chapter 2 of Jonah, we read in verse 2, out of the belly of Sheol I cried, and you heard my voice, for you cast me into the deep, into the heart of the seas, and the floods surrounded me. All your billows and your waves passed over me. 
And then I said, I've been cast out of your sight, yet will I look again toward your holy temple. The water surrounded me, even to my soul. The deep closed around me, and weeds were wrapped around my head. And our professor triumphantly then declared, this has to be a myth, because we know that the waves of the ocean do not flow back and forth inside the belly of whales. And the crowning point is that whales' bellies do not contain seaweed. And so he said, here you have this picture of this Jonah inside this whale's belly, sitting there in the chambers of the belly of the whale, composing this lengthy prayer and, and describing his dangerous situation of all this water passing over him and having his head snarled with the seaweed. Well, I pointed out at that time that the assumption that so many people make when they read this text, and incidentally, it's the assumption that Melville makes. It's one of the errors in Melville's sermon that I read in our last session. The assumption is that the whale is an instrument of threat to the life and to the well-being of Jonah. And sometimes we even think that the whale is sent as divine punishment on Jonah for having disobeyed the command of God to go to Nineveh to preach to that people. And this further assumption is that Jonah, in his prayer of desperation, is crying out to God to save him from his captivity in the belly of the whale. Well, there are some assumptions here that simply are not sound. The first assumption that is made may be sound and may not. The first assumption is that Jonah was swallowed by a whale. The Bible does not say that Jonah was swallowed by a whale. It simply says that Jonah was swallowed by a great fish. Now, obviously, we jump to the conclusion easily that if he was swallowed by a fish, it would have to be a great fish in order to accommodate the size of a human being in its stomach. And the biggest fish that we're aware of is the whale, and so it's easy to draw the inference that Jonah was swallowed by a whale, even though the Bible doesn't say that. Now, the other salient point there is it may have been a whale. We don't know for sure, but it says that God prepared a great fish to swallow up Jonah. So this could have been a whale that God in his providence directed to this place at that time to swallow Jonah, or it could have been a special act of creation. He could have created a unique fish for that opportunity. We don't know. All we know is that the scriptures say that God appointed a great fish to swallow Jonah. The second assumption that is made that should not be made is the assumption that the whale is an instrument of destruction. When if you look at the text, you don't even have to be that careful. Just a cursory reading of the text should reveal that in this book, the whale is the instrument of redemption. The whale is not sent to punish Jonah or to destroy Jonah. The whale is sent to rescue Jonah. The threat to Jonah's life is not the whale. It's the sea. Jonah is thrown into the sea, and he is about to perish in the sea until he is rescued by the whale. The whale scoops him up and then delivers him to the dry ground, affecting Jonah's salvation. But the most significant false assumption about this text is that when Jonah is praying for deliverance, the assumption is that he is praying for deliverance from the belly of the whale. Because after all, the word belly is used here, where in verse 17 of chapter 1 we read, Now the Lord had prepared a great fish to swallow Jonah, and Jonah was in the belly of the fish three days and three nights. There's the word belly. And so we have a reference to Jonah's being in the belly of the great fish. But in chapter 2, 
when we have the record of Jonah's prayer, we read in verse 1, Jonah prayed to the Lord his God from the fish's belly. There's the second reference to the belly. And he said, I cried out to the Lord because of my affliction, and he answered me, Out of the belly of Sheol I cried. Now we have the third reference to belly. And since the first two references to belly clearly refer to the belly of the whale, it is natural to assume that the third reference to belly would also refer to the belly of the whale. It's not what Jonah says, or the belly of the great fish. Rather, he says, he cried out of the belly of Sheol. Now, one place where we know Jonah is not is in Sheol, because Sheol is the place of the dead where, in Old Testament categories, people went after they died to that shadowy place of darkness beyond the grave. Jonah is alive, and he is on this planet, and he is not in Sheol. And yet, in the prayer, he says he cried out of the belly of Sheol. So obviously, he is using the phrase belly of Sheol in a figurative sense. And remember, everything up until this verse is written in a historical narrative prose. Now, the prayer that he writes is composed in poetic meter. And he uses the phrase belly of Sheol in a poetic manner. Now the question is, if it's a figurative use of the term belly here, that distinguishes it, at least from a literary perspective, from the first two uses, which are clearly historical narrative, that clearly refer to the location within the great fish's stomach. But you see how easy it would be to just slide into the third reference to belly and assume he's crying for deliverance from the belly of the whale. No, the whole content of his cry for deliverance is a prayer that he is praying to be rescued from the sea. And the sea is Jonah's belly of hell, or belly of Sheol that is about to engulf him and destroy him. That's the point we have to see, or the prayer won't make any sense at all. Now, beloved, waves do go to and fro in the sea, and there is seaweed in the sea. That's why it's called seaweed, because it belongs in the sea. Now, let's look at this prayer. And assume for a moment with me, if you will, that when he says, out of the belly of Sheol I cried, assume that the belly of Sheol refers to the sea and not to the stomach of the great fish. And you heard my voice, for you cast me into the deep. Now, there's no doubt that to which the deep refers. It doesn't refer to the belly of the fish. It refers to the water into the heart of the seas. And I'm saying to you that there's a parallelism here, and we have two organs of the human body that are used in a poetic sense and in a figurative sense in close conjunction here in this prayer. The belly of Sheol, the heart of the sea. Belly and heart refer to the same place, just as Sheol and the sea do in this poetic parallelism. And the floods surrounded me. All your billows and your waves passed over me. Visualize that. Is this a man inside a fish? Or is this a man thrashing about for his life in the midst of the ocean? It's clearly referring to his plight of which he is about to drown. And I said, I've been cast out of your sight, yet I will look again toward your holy temple. The water surrounded me. 
even to my soul. The deep closed around me. Again, he's crying about his predicament in the water. Weeds were wrapping around my head. I went down to the moorings of the mountains, and the earth with its bars closed behind me forever, yet you have brought up my life from the pit, O oh Lord my God. How does God bring up his life from the pit? By means of the great fish. It is the great fish that God sends that saves Jonah from certain death in a watery grave in the vast pit of the ocean. When my soul fainted within me, I remembered the Lord, and my prayer went up to you into your holy temple. And those who regard worthless idols forsake their own mercy. But I will sacrifice to you with the voice of thanksgiving. I will pay what I have vowed. Salvation is of the Lord. And so the Lord spoke to the fish, and it vomited Jonah onto dry ground. So first of all, the prayer is a prayer for deliverance from the sea. The end of the prayer is a prayer of thanksgiving, because Jonah is rescued from the sea and from the certain death that threatened him by this instrument of redemption that God prepared in his providence to send to rescue his disobedient servant from the sea. And so he says, with the voice of thanksgiving, I will pay what I have vowed. Now he is not only thankful, but in his gratitude he is repentant. And he is resolved now to do the bidding of God. He is resolved now to obey the mission on which God has sent him. He's going to pay his vow. And he says that on the basis of one of the most important, succinct statements about redemption in all of Scripture. Salvation is of the Lord. Other nations perhaps would have responded differently. I can just see pagans in that day, if they encountered what Jonah encountered, coming out on the dry land and then making an idol in the form of a whale or of a great fish and saying, salvation is of the god of the fish. Salvation is of Dagon, the Philistine god, whose image was a fish and who was regarded as the fish god. But Jonah understands that the fish is not his ultimate deliverer. The fish is simply the means by which God himself intervenes to rescue Jonah. And Jonah makes the declaration that every Christian should make every day. Salvation is of the Lord. Jonah did not save himself. Jonah was utterly powerless to save himself. Jonah's doom was sure and certain. The only possible way he could be rescued was by divine intervention, by divine initiative, by God reaching down and doing for Jonah what Jonah could not do for himself. This is a masterful lesson in our utter dependence upon the sovereign grace of God to save us body and soul from clear and certain destruction. Salvation is of the Lord. We've seen in the past that when God brings redemption, the end of his plan is our salvation, and he uses means to that end. Now, it would be a mistake for us to confuse the means with the end. And it would also be a mistake for us to use the means of salvation with the ultimate source of salvation. For example, the New Testament makes it clear that we are saved by faith. Faith is not the end of the Christian life.
It is the means to the end of our salvation. But also, faith is not the grounds or the source of our salvation, but rather it is the Lord God who gives us the faith that is the ultimate basis for our redemption. If we confuse the source and the means, we'll walk around with expanded chests, bragging to others and boasting within ourselves of what we have done to bring about our own salvation, forgetting that even the faith that we exercise is the gift of God. It is a benefit received at His hand and by His grace and by His mercy. And so every Christian who is a believer should look to God as the author and the finisher of their salvation and say without hesitation, my salvation is of the Lord. We've been looking at the little book of the minor prophets, the book of Jonah. And we've seen that Jonah heard the word of God when God commanded him to go on a mission of outreach and of preaching to Nineveh, the capital city of the wicked Assyrian kingdom, the hated enemy of the Jewish people of the 8th century BC. And Jonah disobeyed that command and fled by ship from Joppa headed for Tarshish. And we know the story of how the great foment arose on the sea and Jonah was thrown overboard and then rescued by the intervention of the fish that God had prepared to deliver him. Chapter 3 of Jonah gives us the narrative as it picks up at that point where we read these words in verse 1. Now the word of the Lord came to Jonah the second time. Then let me pause for a minute and say, fortunately for us, God is a God of the second chance. I've often heard people say we're all entitled to one mistake. That's not true. God doesn't entitle us to any mistakes. But if it were true, we would have used up our one mistake a long time ago, <laughs> and it would be very worthless to us. But uh, in this case, Jonah does get a second chance. God comes to him and reissues the original command saying, Arise and go to Nineveh, that great city, and preach to it the message that I tell you. So Jonah arose and went to Nineveh. What a striking contrast that is from chapter 1, where Jonah, after being called to arise, we read there that Jonah arose to flee to Tarshish. Now he does what God tells him to do. He rises, but this time he arises and goes to Nineveh according to the word of the Lord. And the scriptures say this, Now Nineveh was an exceedingly great city, a three-day journey in extent. That is, it would take you three days to walk through the city. And Jonah began to enter the city on the first day's walk. And then he cried out and said, Yet forty days, and Nineveh shall be overthrown. Here is this obscure Jewish prophet that doesn't know anybody in the city of Nineveh. He comes out of nowhere like Elijah out of the desert or John the Baptist out of the wilderness, and he gives an oracle of doom that he announces to this vast, magnificent city, a city that houses one of the most powerful nations, capital, in the ancient world. And he makes this prediction, 40 days, and this city will be overthrown. And you would think no one in that pagan city would listen to him at all. We remember when Paul appeared at the Areopagus in Athens, and as he was about to speak, some of those who were hecklers there said, what will this babbler say? And I'm sure that's the same kind of greeting that Jonah would have expected on this mission. But it's not what happened. The people of Nineveh, we read in verse 5, believed God. Now, pay attention to that phrase there. It doesn't say that the people of Nineveh believed in God. It said they believed God. And there is a huge difference between those. There are lots of people who 
who believe in God in the sense that they believe that God exists. But they don't believe him when he speaks his word. And in a sense, that belies the first conviction. You say that you believe in God, but if you don't believe the God you believe in, you don't really believe in the God who is, because the God who is is eminently believable. He's omniscient. He's impeccable. He never speaks falsehood. Why wouldn't you believe God if you believe in God? But the people of Nineveh, to their credit, believe God, and proclaim the fast, and put on sackcloth from the greatest to the least of them. Now, the proclaiming of the fast and the donning of the sackcloth indicates a spirit of profound and deep repentance. They believed the threatening message, and they responded accordingly in deep repentance. And then word came to the king of Nineveh, and he arose from his throne and laid aside his robe, and covered himself with sackcloth, and sat in ashes. And he caused it to be proclaimed and published throughout Nineveh by the decree of his king and his nobles, saying, Let neither man nor beast, herd nor flock, taste anything. Do not let them eat or drink water, but let man and beast be covered with sackcloth, and cry mightily to God. Let everyone turn from his evil way and from the violence that is in his hand. Who can tell if God will turn and relent and turn away from his fierce anger so that we may not perish? Beloved, I don't know any record in all of history of such a mass action of repentance as what is recorded here about the city of Nineveh, a city that takes three days to walk through it, and the whole city, from the great to the least, including the king, who leaves his throne, which is significant. By getting off his throne, he is acknowledging the authority of the Lord God over him. He takes off his royal robes, all of those signs of power and authority, and dons for himself the clothing of humiliation. He adorns himself in sackcloth, and he sits in the ashes, signaling a posture of repentance. And together with his nobles, issues a decree that his example is to be followed throughout the entire, not just the entire city, but the entire land, including the animals and every person in the land, that there might be a corporate repentance, that the people might mourn of their sins with the hope that God, who has promised the destruction of their city, will relent and turn aside from his anger and be merciful to the people. Well, what happens? In verse 10 of chapter 3, we read this record. And then God saw their works, that they turned from their evil way. And God relented from the disaster that he had said he would bring upon them, and he did not do it. Now, sometimes the Bible speaks of God's repentance when it means, perhaps more accurately, in our language, a relenting rather than a repenting. Because for us, the word repent suggests turning away from some evil deed. God is incapable of turning away from an evil deed because he was never in the way of an evil deed in the first place. God does not have to change his mind from considering sinning. And so he doesn't repent in that sense. That's why the scripture says that God is not a man that he should repent And even the idea of relenting, meaning that he backs off something that he fully intended to do, is somewhat misleading. Even though the Bible uses this language, it uses the language of appearance, it uses what we call phenomenological language, and it uses what we call anthropomorphic language, that is, by which we describe God in human form. We are not to draw the inference from this narrative that God had set about a particular purpose and had decided in his own mind that he was going to do plan A. But when he saw the reaction of the people that he didn't know in advance would happen, he came up with a better plan, plan B, and was persuaded by all of this fasting and repenting to change his mind. 
That's a manner of speaking, and we need to understand that. God knew all along that these people would, in fact, repent. And even though Jonah was directed to give the statement, this city is going to be overthrown in 40 days, and he doesn't say, unless you repent, that unless you repent is elliptical. That is to say, it is clearly implied that God always has the right when he exercises a threat of judgment. He always has the right to rescind that threat by executing mercy. It's the same thing we saw when David wrestled for seven days in prayer when God had said that his child would die and David pled with God for seven days begging God to change his mind and God didn't. The baby died. And when the servants asked David why he did this, he said, as long as there was still life in this baby, I had the hope that perhaps God would choose to exercise his grace, but he didn't. But in this case, God does exercise mercy over the wicked city of Nineveh in light of the people's repentance. Now, can you imagine how the angels in heaven, we are told, rejoice at the repentance of one sinner. And I would say the heavenly host threw a party that afternoon when they saw this mass movement of repentance from the city of Nineveh. And so you would expect that Jonah, being so successful in this mission, would have thrown his hat in the air and said, gee, Lord, I never would have believed that my preaching would have such a marvelous result through your accompanying that word with your power. But that's not the response of Jonah. Remember, these are Israel's most bitter enemies. Jonah perhaps would have been pleased to go to Nineveh simply to be an agent of destruction. He would have liked to have been an avenger of his own people against this wicked city. Instead, he was asked to go and preach repentance to them, and then they repented. And Jonah is furious. Look at chapter 4. But it displeased Jonah exceedingly, and he became angry. So he prayed to the Lord and said, Ah, Lord, was not this what I said when I was still in my country? Therefore I fled previously to Tarshish, for I know you are a gracious and merciful God, slow to anger and abundant in loving kindness, one who relents from doing harm. Therefore now, O Lord, please take my life from me, for it is better for me to die and to live. I knew it, God. I'd just like you to do this. So why I didn't want to go in the first place. I had a feeling that this is what was going to happen, that at the last minute, at the 11th hour, you were going to exercise mercy instead of justice, grace instead of judgment. And now you're going to let these wicked people go, as evil as they are, simply because they repented in sackcloth and ashes. It's not good enough for me. This really makes me mad, and I'd just as soon die than to have to live through this. Now, this is the same man who has himself after he has been disobedient and after he has repented, had been rescued sure and certainly by the grace of God. God was under no obligation to rescue Jonah from the midst of the sea. He could have let Jonah just sink to the bottom of the sea and that would have been the end of it. The sea would have been quiet. The sailors on the ship bound for Tarshish would have been rescued. The great fish would not have despaired and had his appetite ruined by having to swallow this human being. Everything would have been happy and justice would have been done and God could have sent another prophet to Nineveh. Instead, God had saved Jonah out of his sin and out of his hopeless condition. And five minutes later, he's angry because God saved somebody else. Does that speak to you? We have a little slogan in our culture, there but for the grace of God go I. Do we really believe that? There is no room in the Christian heart to enjoy the prospect of the destruction even of the wicked. Because we live moment to moment by God's grace 
And if we have been recipients of grace, why should we despise someone else's receiving the grace of God? But it's hard when we see God be gracious to those who have been hostile to us. We don't want God to forgive those who trespass against us. We want God to forgive us, but not to forgive those who sin against us. And at that point, Jonah is every inch the man. He is so common, so typical of all of us in a situation such as this. And then in verse 4 we read this, chapter 4, verse 4, Then the Lord said, Is it right for you to be angry? If ever was a rhetorical question, here it is. Jonah had absolutely no right whatsoever to be angry. And God puts the question to him, is, is this right, Jonah? Do you have any right whatsoever to be angry when I bestow my grace on somebody else? What would you say to that? How would you answer that question? Do you ever have any right to be angry if God is merciful to your enemies? Of course not. So Jonah went out of the city and sat on the east side of the city, and there he made himself a shelter and sat under it in the shade until he might see what would become of the city. And the Lord God prepared a plant and made it come up over Jonah that it might be shade for his head to deliver him from his misery. Here's Jonah sitting out here in the ancient Near East in the middle of the heat of the day with no refuge from the blistering heat that is assaulting him as he's sitting there contemplating the future of Nineveh. And God now does another act of mercy in Jonah's behalf. He prepared a plant. Again, it makes me wonder whether the fish that delivered Jonah was a special creation, because the same language is used here, that God specially prepared a fish to rescue Jonah in the first place, and now as he's exposed not to the water, but to the heat, God makes another special preparation to rescue Jonah. He prepared a plant, made it come up over Jonah to be shade for his head, to deliver him from his misery. And we read, so Jonah was very grateful for the plant. But as the morning dawned the next day, God prepared a worm. And it so damaged the plant that it withered. And it happened that when the sun arose, that God prepared a vehement east wind, and the sun beat on Jonah's head so that he grew faint. Every Jewish person who reads this text, every person who lives in Palestine would understand it immediately. He's not just talking about a hot summer day in Florida. He's talking about the effects of the Sirocco, that dreaded wind that comes out of the Mediterranean, picks up heat and dryness from the desert, and it causes the skin to become like sandpaper. And the Sirocco is known to kill many, many people because it just sucks the moisture out of a person's body and out of their face. And it's like being caught in the middle of a sandstorm almost although with exceedingly great heat that accompanies it. And this is what happens. God prepared. Do you see what God prepared? He prepared a plant. He prepared a worm. And now he prepares a vehement east wind. And the sun beat on Jonah's head so that he grew faint. And he wished death for himself and said, It is better for me to die than to live. And so God asked Jonah another question. Is it right for you to be angry about the plant? And Jonah said, it is right for me to be angry, even to death. I am going to be mad at you until I die, because that's not fair. My only comfort was that plant. Thank you very much for giving me the plant, but what kind of game are you playing, God? No sooner do you give me the shade and the benefits and the relief from misery of the plant, the next thing that happens, you send this worm to eat the plant, and so I lose my shade, and as soon as I lose my shade, you prepare a vehement east wind, the Sirocco, to come in and scorch my very life. Yes, I'm angry about the plant, and this time I'm going to stay angry with you, oh God. But the Lord said, Jonah, you've had pity on a plant for which you have not labored nor made it grow, which came up in a night and perished in a night. 
And should I not pity Nineveh, that great city, in which are more than 120,000 persons who cannot discern between their right hand and their left, and much livestock? And the story ends abruptly. What's the lesson, Jonah? You care more about that plant than you care about these people. Centuries later, Saul, as he contemplated the state of the souls of his own countrymen who had rejected Christ, swore a vow before God saying that he would, that he himself were cursed if it could mean the salvation of his people. Paul cared so much about people that he was willing to surrender his own redemption for their sake. And what God is showing Jonah and showing us is that it is not right to care more about things than about people, to care more about our own comfort than about the redemption of one lost soul. The story of Jonah is a lesson not in ancient living, but in contemporary living. Because though I believe Jonah was a real historical person, and there are a host of reasons why I believe that, the New Testament certainly regards him as a real person of history. Our Lord himself regarded Jonah as a real person from history. Beyond his uniqueness as a real live individual, in a significant way, Jonah is every man. He is all of us who failed to keep the great commandment to love the Lord his God with all of his might and all of his mind and all of his soul and his neighbor as much as himself. He was not prepared to love his enemies, which commandment is at the very heart of the teaching of Jesus. He could not delight in the salvation of those whom he hated. He wasn't able to rejoice in the repentance of others and became more concerned for his own comfort than for the eternal rest of human beings. Beloved, that's a powerful message, and it's one I need to hear, and I'm sure it's one we all need to hear. In our study of Jonah, the book and the man, we've been sort of shaking our finger at Jonah, tis tisking him for his great sin of being unconcerned for the Ninevites, and I think it's a temptation for us to treat Jonah in the like manner to which he treated the Ninevites. We think, thankfully, we're not like that, but I'm afraid often we are, aren't we? Isn't there a sense in which we share Jonah's tendency to treat certain people, certain groups of peoples as somehow too far gone and beyond the reach of God's grace? Well, R.C., there are two things here. On the one hand, there are those who write off other people abruptly, okay? And the second problem is in not rejoicing when your enemies, in fact, do repent. The ones that you have written off now come home and we resent that. That's something that Jesus had to encounter in the New Testament when he gave the parable of the workers that all agreed to work for a certain wage. And I said, I would come to work at 8 o'clock and work from 8 to 5 for X number of denaria. And then the owner needs extra work done at 3 o'clock in the afternoon and he hires somebody in this emergency. and pays them the same wage from three to four as he pays me from eight to four. And these people were all upset about it. It's a great Jesus, parable. Jesus said, wait a minute, did we have an agreement here? I didn't force you to work. I, you, this agreement was made. And the point is that people sometimes are resentful when they see people who have lived life in a wild and exaggerated way who come to repentance in their old age and die and go to heaven. They say, that's not fair. The guy had a good time all his life, and, then, <laughs> and here I've been trying to be righteous. Those kinds of reactions of hostility towards God's grace and mercy are replete throughout Scripture. Let me give you an example from our own day. The AIDS epidemic has created a situation that's unique in our history. It's America's first politicized disease. And there is great hostility often voiced within the church about efforts to do ministry to people who have AIDS with the assumption 
that they have gotten AIDS for one of two reasons, either because they were involved in illicit homosexual activity or, second of all, because they contracted the disease from using contaminated needles in illegal drug usage. And so often the smug response, both inside the church and outside of the church, is, hey, these people have this horrible disease because of their own sin, too bad. Now, I don't think the church has to compromise its ethic and its teachings about God's saying we're not allowed to be involved in homosexual activities, and yet at the same time have a ministry of compassion to those people who have come into this dreadful disease. In simple language, if we're walking down the street and we find somebody hopelessly wounded, lying in a ditch by the side of the road, it is not our business to ask them how they got there. That's God's business. Our business is to exercise as much mercy, as much concern, and as much care as we possibly can. And that is the spirit of compassion that I believe is being communicated here in the book of Jonah, where Jonah is the negative example who lacks that kind of compassion. I mean, I feel badly for any human being who is suffering from AIDS. I don't care how they got AIDS. I mean, I do care how AIDS is contracted. I care about that, and I care about the, the problems, and I'm not wanting to endorse those kinds of behavioral patterns. But the point I'm making is a simple one. If they're hurting and we have the opportunity to be a balm in Gilead, we are to do that. And it's shameful for the church to despise sinners, ever, for any reason. Because the one qualification that is an absolutely necessary qualification for a person to be a member of a Christian church is that that person has to be a sinner. You cannot be a member of the church unless you are one. And the only difference between the Christian and the impenitent person, the true Christian has repented. And the other person hasn't. Both guilty of sin. And a person who has truly repented of his sin and thrown himself on the mercy of the court, it is unthinkable to me that that person could refuse grace to somebody else. That's why we have this simple statement in the Lord's Prayer that's the scariest statement and it's the most dangerous prayer we can ever pray. Forgive us our trespasses as we forgive those who trespass against us. If the only way God exercised His mercy to me was in direct proportion to the level in which I exercise mercy to my enemies, I'm in big trouble. But yet that's the ethic of the Christian, to have the same spirit of mercy and compassion towards sinners as God has had towards us. So we lack a sufficiently deep sense of the grace of God, but I think also the other image that you made that somehow we're almost jealous of these folks that they went out and had this wonderful time shows a deep failure to understand the grace of the law. Exactly, because it is a supreme benefit to the Christian not to have spent his or her whole life in a wasted lifestyle. And there is such a thing, although you know, I, there's probably no one in the world that preaches more adamantly in behalf of the doctrine of justification by faith alone as I do, and that our works add absolutely nothing to the grounds of our salvation, that I bring no merit whatsoever before God, only demerit, and yet at the same time, God does promise that even though our works are not meritorious, He promises to reward them anyway. And it's a tremendous benefit for a person to repent early in life and to be reconciled to God and begin the growth and process of sanctification so that they are storing up treasure in heaven. And the person who is a late convert to the faith has an eternal disadvantage at that point because he has less opportunity to store up such a treasure. The second thing that struck me as we were considering the Ninevites and trying to think about how that might apply to us not only should we have a deeper sense of what God's grace is, but it really challenged me to think about the possibility of God's showering His grace on an incredibly corrupt culture or nation. If it can happen in Nineveh, if God can prepare the Ninevites for repentance and do it in this huge city in this astounding way from these incredibly corrupt people overnight, He can do it again. Yeah, there are two sides to that coin. Now, on the one hand, there is the optimistic side that if God can bring that kind of a nation to repentance so abruptly, He can do it for any nation, including ours. 
It's just like the Reformation in Scotland. One angry lady kicked over a chair in a meeting, and overnight the Reformation swept through Scotland. And you never know what kind of an incident can happen like that that God will use to bring about rapid and significant change. And we have a tendency to project the status quo into the future. We also have a tendency to project it into the past. When I've done marriage counseling and people's marriages are breaking up, incredibly often I'll hear from one of the partners, well, we've been married for 10 years, but I never did love my partner. You know, uh -huh. I say, well, wait a minute. You mean to tell me that you went out on a date the first time, couldn't stand this lady, and you asked her out again? And you kept doing it, and the more you dated her, the less you loved her, and then you asked her to marry her? You're talking nonsense. <laughs> there was a time in your life where at least you thought you were in love with her. But even more significant is that when couples are in that kind of a situation in marriage, and their marriage is miserable, they cannot see any possibility of change. They think it's always been this bad, it will always be this bad. When tomorrow, it could change dramatically. And in six months, a tremendous change can take place, and so on. And so you have that kind of problem of projecting into the future and into the past. The other problem is this, that the Assyrians, as we've mentioned, were despised enemies of Israel. And the assumption that the Jewish people made, including Jonah, is that God was on their side. And this is the prophet Habakkuk's whole story. If you read Habakkuk, where he goes up into his watchtower and he complains that God is too holy as to even behold iniquity, what does Habakkuk complain? He's complaining because God has taken a nation that was abominably wicked and raised that nation up to conquer Israel, God's chosen nation. And Habakkuk said, how can you do that? I know that we have sin in our house, but this other nation is far worse than we are. And what's God's answer? I know that. But I'm using them to punish you. I'll take care of them. It's none of your business. It's like, I, this used to bother me a lot during the Cold War and everything. Everybody said, well, if there's ever a conflict between Russia, the evil empire, and America, certainly we will win because God is on our side. That's scary thinking. Because Russia, during Stalin, could have been the most evil empire, or Germany under Hitler could have been the most evil empire in our day. And God could well have decided to use those nations to chasten us. And today, of course, I wonder who is the evil empire. <laughs> who might we be being raised up to chasten? Yes. <laughs> well, uh, in your first lecture, you talked about this song you sang as a child in the choir with your surplus and your little cap. Uh, Seek ye the Lord while he may be found. And I was struck from then through yesterday's show that you tend to see quite a few lessons here on God's sovereignty and man's sinfulness in Jonah. Uh, you talked about how God raised up this fish, how God raised up this plant, how God sent the wind, how God uh, did these things. And I think that that's still something that we miss a lot in the church when we do see things change in history say the collapse in some sense of the Soviet Union, the, the tearing down of the Berlin Wall, uh, these kind of changes, we sort of see them as happening by chance and randomly. Now, I'm not suggesting that we can look at our Sunday paper and determine what the purposes of God are and all that He's doing. But I think it's important for us to remember that God's doing these things. Well, R.C., I agree with that, and this might be a good time to sell my book, Not a Chance, because you know what I think about chance. <laughs> chance doesn't do anything. It has no power whatsoever. But yes, people tend to think that it was by chance that the Berlin Wall was torn down. And yet we know from our understanding of the providence of God that ultimately the ultimate agent of change there was God himself. It was God who ripped that wall down. But there's another side to that coin. It was God who put it up. <laughs> I mean, it was through the providence of God that that wall was built in the first place. Not as an act of His mercy or an act of His grace, but as an act of judgment. I don't know against whom. And you say, well, it doesn't mean that we should be sitting there reading the paper on Sunday to determine the hand of providence. Well, there's one page in the Sunday paper that will tell you absolutely nothing about the providence of God. For sure. Okay. 
And that's the horoscope page. Absolutely. <laughs> because we can't know what the providence of God will be tomorrow, except insofar as God himself in Scripture has given us those future prophecies. But in the other sense, what every newspaper does every day is chronicles the providence of God. When I read Sunday's paper, I know what the providence of God did on Saturday. Just yesterday, we had... Hurricane Aaron passed by right over top of us. At the time, God and His providence had turned it into something less than a hurricane. And as we speak, that's heading towards the panhandle of Florida and is a hurricane again. I mean, if there's a lesson uh, in, in God's sovereignty, here we have a wind that God raised up and just the change from hurricane to not hurricane to hurricane, from this, you know, heading towards this part of the state to that part of the state. Watching the you know news or listening on the radio to hear where it's going, what it's doing, is again a lesson that God is driving this thing. It really is. It's, it, it is a dramatic lesson in providence. You know, anytime those of us who live in Florida understand this, a lot of our friends who are listening to us now may not. But but whenever a tropical storm develops during hurricane season out in the Caribbean there is a very careful mechanism of watching the progress, the development, and the movement of these storm cells, watching the velocity of the winds as they move towards hurricane velocity because we're acutely conscious of how much devastation can be wrought by a hurricane, as Hurricane Andrew so obviously demonstrated. But I am amazed when I watch the Weather Channel and the satellite information, how technical is the measuring apparatus that is used and the information that is gathered and communicated there, and yet at the same time, how much of it's guesswork. You never know until it happens where it's going to hit. And obviously, I mean, you know what your mother's like, R.C. She is uh, Priscilla preparation. <laughs> When somebody says there's going to be a storm, all the bathtubs are filled with water. She has the flashlights and the kerosene lamps ready, and she's got everything prepared, and all the things are battened down and so on. And she was like that. And and I'm sitting there thinking, well, you know, the thing may not even hit here. <laughs> we, don't, we don't know for sure. And then I watched the day of the hurricane, how all the people were saying, boy, are we lucky. Because Aaron passed 10 miles south of Kissimmee. Well, we were fortunate in Orlando to miss the brunt of the hurricane. But what about the people in Kissimmee? And the people that lived 10 miles south of Kissimmee? And what about the people that were preparing for it on the Gulf Coast as it rose again into greater velocity? But the thing is, do we really believe that even such a thing as a hurricane comes from the hand of God? I mean, here we have in Jonah a biblical record where it says God prepared a great vehement east wind. There's one case where a great and vehement wind was authored by God. And I think it's safe to say he authors all of them. I think it's interesting that this particular hurricane, I know they do this, if you will, by chance, name these hurricanes, but this hurricane was named Hurricane Aaron. Aaron is a word I'm familiar with. It's a name in my list for any upcoming daughters that God and His providence may give me, uh, because it means two things that mean a great deal to me. It means Ireland, as you know, but it also means peace, yes. from which we get the word ironic, yes. or peaceful. And I thought, this is interesting, a hurricane named Peace is coming this way. And I think because, again, you have raised me anyway to believe in God's sovereignty, I went to bed and slept like a baby, <laughs> so not I worried about it. Right through. <laughs> uh, not concerned about it. That it is in God's hands, and He will do what He will do. The last thing I wanted to cover before we're through, something I've been thinking about lately. I've had a one of my wife's distant relatives passed away recently, and he was not a believer, and that has, of course, caused us to consider where he is and what he's experiencing. He is, in fact, right now in the belly of Sheol and not going to be rescued. And it struck me, as I'm considering this, here we are doing this series on Jonah, 
that we really do lack a sense of urgency for the saving of the lost. In part because we think we're better than them, but also right now especially in this particular time in the church because we don't believe what's waiting for them. We don't believe how horrible it is. And it's like the story of the convict in prison who had been sentenced to prison for a most violent crime but experienced a dramatic conversion to Christ. And after he was converted, he had a zeal and a passion to introduce all of his cellmates and prison friends to the Lord. And yet one of the things that hurt him and wounded him was the sense of indifference that he felt from the church. You know, he wanted to know, why haven't I heard about these things earlier? And he said, I would crawl over glass to tell the story of Christ to other lost people. And I think most of us begin that way when we understand the initial impact of our conversion. But it has a tendency to cool down after a way. Let me just take a minute to tell you another story that, that made a tremendous impact on me of a lady who was a missionary uh, to a primitive tribe of people who did not even have their own language in written form. She not only had to learn their language, but she had to teach them how to write it. And she worked with them for 10 years. And for 10 years she worked to translate one book of the Bible, the book of Matthew. And to expedite the matter, she left out all the begatitudes at the beginning, and just so that she could give the essence of the life of Christ. And after 10 years, the work was finally finished and was brought back into the jungle on a truck. And she was so, so excited. And the natives came out, and all of them came out in mass on that occasion for the delivery date. But nobody was interested in the book of Matthew. They were only interested in this truck this unusual invention that they had never seen before, and they ignored her work. And so she didn't give up, and she then, uh, in her second edition, included the Begatitudes. And she gave a copy of it to the chief of the village. And that night, the chief came to her door late at night, woke her up, and was beside himself, and said, are you telling me that this Jesus that you've been telling us about for 10 years is real, not just a myth, that he really lived, that was the begatitudes that clued in the chief. And she said, yes. And he said to her, do you know him personally? I mean, have you ever met him? And she said, no, 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 no. He, he lived on this earth before I was born. Well, did your mother and father meet him personally? No. And she was trying to communicate to him that he lived 2,000 years ago, and the only way she could do it was to use some sticks on the ground where each stick represented uh, so many years. And, and she laid out these sticks in front of the chief to explain how long ago Jesus lived. And with each stick, his countenance faded greater and greater until at the end he grasped how long ago Jesus had lived. And he said, but why hasn't anybody ever told us this before? That's the question that we're left with from Jonah. 